a connecticut yankee in king arthur's court by mark twain chapter twenty three restoration of the fountain saturday noon i went to the well and looked on a while merlin was still burning smoke powders and pawing the air and muttering gibberish as hard as ever but looking pretty downhearted for of course he had not started even a perspiration in that well yet finally i said how does the thing promise by this time partner behold i am even now busied with trial of the powerfulest enchantment known to the princes of the occult arts in the lands of the east and it fail me naught can avail peace until i finish he raised a smoke this time that darkened all the region and must have made matters uncomfortable for the hermits for the wind was their way and it rolled down over their dens in a dense and billowy fog he poured out volumes of speech to match and contorted his body and sawed the air with his hands in a most extraordinary way at the end of twenty minutes he dropped down panting and about exhausted now arrived the abbot and several hundred monks and nuns and behind them a multitude of pilgrims and a couple of acres of foundlings all drawn by the prodigious smoke and all in a grand state of excitement the abbot inquired anxiously for results merlin said if any labor of mortal might break the spell that binds these waters this which i have but just essayed had done it it has failed whereby i do now know that that which i had feared is a truth established the sign of this failure is that the most potent spirit known to the magicians of the east and whose name none may utter and live has laid his spell upon this well the mortal does not breathe nor ever will who can penetrate the secret of that spell and without that secret none can break it the water will flow no more for ever good father i have done what man could suffer me to go of course this threw the abbot into a good deal of consternation he turned to me with the signs of it in his face and said ye have heard him is it true part of it is not all then not all what part is true that that spirit with the russian name has put his spell upon the well god's wounds then are we ruined possibly but not certainly ye mean not certainly that is it wherefore ye also mean that when he saith none can break the spell yes when he says that he says what isn't necessarily true there are conditions under which an effort to break it may have some chance that is some small some trifling chance of success the conditions oh they are nothing difficult only these i want the well and the surroundings for the space of half a mile entirely to myself from sunset to-day until i remove the ban and nobody allowed to cross the ground but by my authority are these all yes and you have no fear to try oh none one may fail of course and one may also succeed one can try and i am ready to chance it i have my conditions these and all others ye may name i will issue commandment to that effect wait said merlin with an evil smile ye wit that he that would break this spell must know that spirit's name yes i know his name and wit you also that to know it skills not of itself but ye must likewise pronounce it ha <laughs> knew ye that yes i knew that too you had that knowledge art a fool are ye minded to utter that name and die utter it why certainly i would utter it if it was welsh ye are even a dead man then and i go to tell arthur that's all right take your grip stack and get along the thing for you to do is to go home and work the weather john w merlin it was a home shot and it made him wince for he was the worst weather failure in the kingdom whenever he ordered up the danger signals along the coast there was a week's dead calm sure and every time he prophesied fair weather it rained brickbats but i kept him in the weather bureau right along to undermine his reputation however that shot raised his bile and instead of starting home to report my death he said he would remain and enjoy it my two experts arrived in the evening and pretty well fagged for they had traveled double tides 
they had pack mules along and had brought everything i needed tools pump lead pipe greek fire sheaves of big rockets roman candles colored fire sprays electric apparatus and a lot of sundries everything necessary for the stateliest kind of a miracle they got their supper and a nap and about midnight we sallied out through a solitude so wholly vacant and complete that it quite overpassed the required conditions we took possession of the well and its surroundings my boys were experts in all sorts of things from the stoning up of a well to the constructing of a mathematical instrument an hour before sunrise we had that leak mended in shipshape fashion and the water began to rise then we stowed our fireworks in the chapel locked up the place and went home to bed before the noon mass was over we were at the well again for there was a deal to do yet and i was determined to spring the miracle before midnight for business reasons for whereas a miracle worked for the church on a weekday is worth a good deal it is worth six times as much if you get it in on a sunday in nine hours the water had risen to its customary level that is to say it was within twenty-three feet of the top we put in a little iron pump one of the first turned out by my works near the capital we bored into a stone reservoir which stood against the outer wall of the well chamber and inserted a section of lead pipe that was long enough to reach the door of the chapel and project beyond the threshold where the gushing water would be visible to the two hundred and fifty acres of people i was intending should be present on the flat plain in front of this little holy hillock at the proper time we knocked the head out of an empty hogshead and hoisted this hogshead to the flat roof of the chapel where we clamped it down fast poured in gunpowder till it lay loosely an inch deep on the bottom then we stood up rockets in the hogshead as thick as they would loosely stand all the different breeds of rockets there are and they made a portly and imposing sheaf i can tell you we grounded the wire of a pocket electrical battery in that powder we placed a whole magazine of greek fire on each corner of the roof blue on one corner green on another red on another and purple on the last and grounded a wire in each about two hundred yards off in the flat we built a pen of scantlings about four feet high and laid planks on it and so made a platform we covered it with swell tapestries borrowed for the occasion and topped it off with the abbot's own throne when you are going to do a miracle for an ignorant race you want to get in every detail that will count you want to make all the properties impressive to the public eye you want to make matters comfortable for your head guest then you can turn yourself loose and play your effects for all they are worth i know the value of these things for i know human nature you can't throw too much style into a miracle it costs trouble and work and sometimes money but it pays in the end well we brought the wires to the ground at the chapel and then brought them under the ground to the platform and hid the batteries there we put a rope fence a hundred feet square around the platform to keep off the common multitude and that finished the work my idea was doors open at ten thirty performance to begin at eleven twenty five sharp i wished i could charge admission but of course that wouldn't answer i instructed my boys to be in the chapel as early as ten before anybody was around and be ready to man the pumps at the proper time and make the fur fly then we went home to supper the news of the disaster to the well had traveled far by this time and now for two or three days a steady avalanche of people had been pouring into the valley the lower end of the valley was become one huge camp we should have a good house no question about that criers went the rounds early in the evening and announced the coming attempt which put every pulse up to fever heat they gave notice that the abbot and his official suite would move in state and occupy the platform at ten thirty up to which time all the region which was under my ban must be clear the bells would then cease from tolling and this sign should be permission to the multitudes to close in and take their places i was at the platform and all ready to do the honors when the abbot's solemn procession hove in sight which it did not do till it was nearly to the rope fence because it was a starless black night and no torches permitted with it came merlin and took a front seat on the platform he was as good as his word for once one could not see the multitudes banked together beyond the band but they were there just the same the moment the bells stopped those banked masses broke and poured over the line like a vast black wave 
and for as much as a half hour it continued to flow, and then it solidified itself, and you could have walked upon a pavement of human heads to, well, miles. We had a solemn stage wait now for about twenty minutes, a thing I had counted on for effect. It is always good to let your audience have a chance to work up its expectancy. At length, out of the silence, a noble Latin chant, men's voices, broke and swelled up and rolled away into the night, a majestic tide of melody. I had put that up, too, and it was one of the best effects I ever invented. When it was finished, I stood up on the platform and extended my hands abroad for two minutes with my face uplifted. That always produces a dead hush, and then slowly pronounced this ghastly word with a kind of awfulness which caused hundreds to tremble and many women to faint. Constantinopolitanischer Dudelsax Pfeifen Machers Gesellschaft. Just as I was moaning out the closing hunks of that word, I touched off one of my electric connections, and all that murky world of people stood revealed in a hideous blue glare. It was immense, that effect. Lots of people shrieked. Women curled up and quit in every direction. Foundlings collapsed by platoons. The abbot and the monks crossed themselves nimbly, and their lips fluttered with agitated prayers. Merlin held his grip, but he was astonished clear down to his corns. He had never seen anything to begin with that before. Now was the time to pile in the effects. I lifted my hands and groaned out this word, as it were in agony. Nihilisten dynamite theater scheitschens plankens astendens versagungen, and turned on the red fire. You should have heard that Atlantic of people moan and howl when that crimson hell joined the blue. After sixty seconds I shouted, Transvaal Truppen, Truppen, Transport, Trampel, Theater, Übertragungs, Streiten, Tragedy, and lit up the green fire. After waiting only forty seconds this time, I spread my arms abroad and thundered out the devastating syllables of this word of words. Mecca, Musul, Manen, Massen, Menken, Murder, Moren, Mütter, Mar, Mor, Monumentum, Macher, and whirled on the purple glare. There they were, all going at once, red, blue, green, purple four furious volcanoes pouring vast clouds of radiant smoke aloft, and spreading a blinding rainbowed noonday to the furthest confines of that valley. In the distance one could see that fellow on the pillar standing rigid against the background of sky, his seesaw stopped for the first time in twenty years. I knew the boys were at the pump now and ready, so I said to the abbot, "'The time is come, father!' I am about to pronounce the dread name and command the spell to dissolve. You want to brace up and take hold of something. Then I shouted to the people, Behold! In another minute the spell will be broken, or no mortal can break it. If it break, all will know it, for you will see the sacred water gush from the chapel door. I stood a few moments to let the hearers have a chance to spread my announcement to those who couldn't hear, and so convey it to the furthest ranks. Then I made a grand exhibition of extra posturing and gesturing, and shouted, Lo! I command the fell spirit that possesses the holy fountain to now disgorge into the skies all the infernal fires that still remain in him and straightway dissolve his spell and flee hence to the pit there to lie bound a thousand years by his own dread name i command it then i touched off the hogshead of rockets and a vast fountain of dazzling lances of fire vomited itself toward the zenith with a hissing rush, and burst in mid-sky into a storm of flashing jewels. One mighty groan of terror started up from the massed people, then suddenly broke into a wild hosanna of joy, for there, fair and plain, in the uncanny glare, they saw the freed water leaping forth. 
the old abbot could not speak a word for tears and the choking in his throat without utterance of any sort he folded me in his arms and mashed me it was more eloquent than speech and harder to get over too in a country where there were really no doctors that were worth a damaged nickel you should have seen those acres of people throw themselves down in that water and kiss it kiss it and pet it and fondle it and talk to it as if it were alive and welcome it back with the dear names they gave their darlings just as if it had been a friend who was long gone away and lost and was come home again yes it was pretty to see and made me think more of them than i had done before i sent merlin home on a shutter he had caved in and gone down like a landslide when i pronounced that fearful name and had never come to since he never had heard that name before neither had i but to him it was the right one any jumble would have been the right one he admitted afterward that the spirit's own mother could not have pronounced that name better than i did he never could understand how i survived it and i didn't tell him it is only young magicians that give away a secret like that merlin spent three months working enchantments to try to find out the deep trick of how to pronounce that name and outlive it but he didn't arrive when i started to the chapel the populace uncovered and fell back reverently to make a wide way for me as if i had been some kind of a superior being and i was i was aware of that i took along a night shift of monks and taught them the mystery of the pump and set them to work for it was plain that a good part of the people out there were going to sit up with the water all night consequently it was but right that they should have all they wanted of it to those monks that pump was a good deal of a miracle itself and they were full of wonder over it and of admiration too of the exceeding effectiveness of its performance it was a great night an immense night there was reputation in it i could hardly get to sleep for glorying over it end of chapter twenty three a connecticut yankee in king arthur's court by mark twain chapter twenty four a rival magician my influence in the valley of holiness was something prodigious now it seemed worth while to try to turn it to some valuable account the thought came to me the next morning and was suggested by my seeing one of my knights who was in the soap line come riding in according to history the monks of this place two centuries before had been worldly minded enough to want to wash it might be that there was a leaven of this unrighteousness still remaining so i sounded a brother wouldn't you like a bath he shuddered at the thought the thought of the peril of it to the well but he said with feeling one needs not to ask that of a poor body who has not known that blessed refreshment sith that he was a boy would god i might wash me but it may not be fair sir tempt me not it is forbidden and then he sighed in such a sorrowful way that i was resolved he should have at least one layer of his real estate removed if it sized up my whole influence and bankrupted the pile so i went to the abbot and asked for a permit for this brother he blenched at the idea i don't mean that you could see him blench for of course you couldn't see it without you scraped him and i didn't care enough about it to scrape him but i knew the blench was there just the same and within a book's covers thickness of the surface too blenched and trembled he said ah son ask aught else thou wilt and it is thine and freely granted out of a grateful heart but this oh this would you drive away the blessed water again no father i will not drive it away i have mysterious knowledge which teaches me that there was an error that other time when it was thought the institution of the bath banished the fountain a large interest began to show up in the old man's face my knowledge informs me that the bath was innocent of that misfortune which was caused by quite another sort of sin these are brave words but uh, but right welcome if they be true oh, they are true indeed let me build the bath again father let me build it again and the fountain shall flow for ever you promise this you promise this say the word say you promise it i do promise it then will i have the first bath myself go get ye to your work tarry not tarry not but go 
I and my boys were at work straight off. The ruins of the old bath were there yet in the basement of the monastery, not a stone missing. They had been left just so all these lifetimes, and avoided with a pious fear as things accursed. In two days we had it all done and the water in, a spacious pool of clear, pure water that a body could swim in. It was running water, too. It came in and went out through the ancient pipes. The old abbot kept his word and was the first to try it. He went down black and shaky, leaving the whole black community above troubled and worried and full of bodings. But he came back white and joyful, and the game was made. Another triumph scored. It was a good campaign that we made in that valley of holiness, and I was very well satisfied and ready to move on now, but I struck a disappointment. I caught a heavy cold, and it started up an old lurking rheumatism of mine. Of course the rheumatism hunted up my weakest place and located itself there. This was the place where the abbot put his arms about me and mashed me, what time he was moved to testify his gratitude to me with an embrace. When at last I got out, I was a shadow. But everybody was full of attentions and kindnesses, and these brought cheer back into my life, and were the right medicine to help a convalescent swiftly up toward health and strength again. So I gained fast. Sandy was worn out with nursing, so I made up my mind to turn out and go a cruise alone, leaving her at the nunnery to rest up. My idea was to disguise myself as a free man of peasant degree and wander through the country a week or two on foot. This would give me a chance to eat and lodge with the lowliest and poorest class of free citizens on equal terms. There was no other way to inform myself perfectly of their everyday life and the operation of the laws upon it. If I went among them as a gentleman, there would be restraints and conventionalities which would shut me out from their private joys and troubles and I would get no further than the outside shell. One morning I was out on a long walk to get up muscle for my trip, and had climbed the ridge which bordered the northern extremity of the valley, when I came upon an artificial opening in the face of a low precipice, and recognized it by its location as a hermitage which had often been pointed out to me from a distance as the den of a hermit of high renown for dirt and austerity. I knew he had lately been offered a situation in the great Sahara, where lions and sand-flies made the hermit life peculiarly attractive and difficult, and had gone to Africa to take possession, so I thought I would look in and see how the atmosphere of this den agreed with its reputation. My surprise was great. The place was newly swept and scoured. Then there was another surprise. Back in the gloom of the cavern I heard the clink of a little bell, and then this exclamation. Hello, Central! Is this you, Camelot? Behold, thou mayst glad thy heart, and thou hast faith to believe the wonderful, when that it cometh in an unexpected guise, and maketh itself manifest in impossible places. Here standeth in the flesh his mightiness the boss, and with thine own ears shall ye hear him speak. Now what a radical reversal of things this was! What a jumbling together of extravagant incongruities! What a fantastic conjunction of opposites and irreconcilables! The home of the bogus miracle become the home of a real one? The den of a medieval hermit turned into a telephone office? The telephone clerk stepped into the light, and I recognized one of my young fellows. I said, "'How long has this office been established here, Ulfius?' "'But since midnight, fair sir boss, and it please you.' We saw many lights in the valley, and so judged it well to make a station, for that where so many lights be, needs must they indicate a town of goodly size. Quite right. It isn't a town in the customary sense, but it's a good stand anyway. Do you know where you are? Of that I have had no time to make inquiry, for when as my comradeship moved hence upon their labors, leaving me in charge, I got me to needed rest, proposing to inquire when I waked and report the place's name to Camelot for record. Well, this is the Valley of Holiness. It didn't take. I mean, he didn't start at the name, as I had supposed he would. He merely said, I will so report it. Why, the surrounding regions are filled with the noise of late wonders that have happened here. You didn't hear of them? Ah, ye will remember we move by night, and avoid speech withal. We learn naught but that we get by the telephone from Camelot. 
why they know all about this thing haven't they told you anything about the great miracle of the restoration of a holy fountain oh that indeed yes but the name of this valley doth woundily differ from the name of that one indeed to differ wider were not pos what was the name then the valley of hellishness that explains it confound a telephone anyway it is the very demon for conveying similarities of sound that are miracles of divergence from similarity of sense but no matter you know the name of the place now call up camelot he did it and had clarence sent for it was good to hear my boy's voice again it was like being home after some affectionate interchanges and some account of my late illness i said what is new the king and queen and many of the court do start even in this hour to go to your valley to pay pious homage to the waters ye have restored and cleanse themselves of sin and see the place where the infernal spirit spouted true hell flames to the clouds and ye listen sharply ye may hear me wink and hear me likewise smile a smile since twas i that made selection of those flames from out of our stock and sent them by your order does the king know the way to this place the king no nor to any other in his realms mayhap but the lads that hope you with your miracle will be his guide and lead the way and appoint the places for rests at noons and sleeps at night this will bring them here when mid-afternoon or later the third day anything else in the way of news uh, the king hath begun the raising of the standing army he suggested to him one regiment is complete and officered the mischief i wanted a main hand in that myself there is only one body of men in the kingdom that are fitted to officer a regular army yes and now you will marvel to know there's not so much as one west pointer in that regiment what are you talking about are you in earnest it is truly as i have said why this is making me uneasy who were chosen and what was the method competitive examination indeed i know naught of the method i but know this these officers be all of noble family and are born uh, what is it you call it uh, chuckleheads there's something wrong clarence comfort yourself then for two candidates for lieutenancy do travel hence with the king young nobles both and if you but wait where you are you will hear them questioned that is news to the purpose i will get one west pointer in anyway mount a man and send him to that school with a message let him kill horses if necessary but he must be there before sunset to-night and say there is no need i have laid a ground wire to the school prithee let me connect you with it, it sounded good in this atmosphere of telephones and lightning communication with distant regions i was breathing the breath of life again after long suffocation i realized then what a creepy dull inanimate horror this land had been to me all these years and how i had been in such a stifled condition of mind as to have grown used to it almost beyond the power to notice it i gave my order to the superintendent of the academy personally i also asked him to bring me some paper and a fountain pen and a box or so of safety matches i was getting tired of doing without these conveniences I could have them now, as I wasn't going to wear armor any more at present, and therefore could get at my pockets. When I got back to the monastery I found a thing of interest going on. The abbot and his monks were assembled in the great hall, observing with childish wonder and faith the performances of a new magician, a fresh arrival. His dress was the extreme of the fantastic, as showy and foolish as the sort of thing an Indian medicine man wears. He was mowing, and mumbling, and gesticulating, and drawing mystical figures in the air and on the floor. The regular thing, you know. He was a celebrity from Asia, so he said, and that was enough. That sort of evidence was as good as gold, and passed current everywhere. How easy and cheap it was to be a great magician on this fellow's terms! His specialty was to tell you what any individual on the face of the globe was doing at the moment, and what he had done at any time in the past and what he would do at any time in the future. He asked if any would like to know what the Emperor of the East was doing now. The sparkling eyes and the delighted rubbing of hands made eloquent answer. This reverend crowd would like to know what that monarch was at, just at this moment. The fraud went through some more mummery, and then made grave announcement. The high and mighty Emperor of the East doth at this moment put money in the palm of a holy begging friar. One, two, 
three pieces and they be all of silver a buzz of admiring exclamations broke out all around it is marvelous wonderful what study what labor to have acquired a so amazing power as this would they like to know what the supreme lord of ind was doing yes he told them what the supreme lord of ind was doing then he told them what the sultan of egypt was at also what the king of the remote seas was about and so on and so on and with each new marvel the astonishment at his accuracy rose higher and higher they thought he must surely strike an uncertain place some time but no he never had to hesitate he always knew and always with unerring precision i saw that if this thing went on i should lose my supremacy this fellow would capture my following i should be left out in the cold i must put a cog in his wheel and do it right away too i said if i may ask i should very greatly like to know what a certain person is doing speak and freely i will tell you it will be difficult perhaps impossible my art knows not the word the more difficult it is the more certainly will i reveal it to you you see i was working up the interest it was getting pretty high too you could see that by the craning necks all around and the half suspended breathing so now i climaxed it if you make no mistake if you tell me truly what i want to know i will give you two hundred silver pennies the fortune is mine i will tell you what you would know then tell me what i am doing with my right hand ah there was a general gasp of surprise it had not occurred to anybody in the crowd that simple trick of inquiring about somebody who wasn't ten thousand miles away the magician was hit hard it was an emergency that had never happened in his experience before and it corked him he didn't know how to meet it he looked stunned confused he couldn't say a word come i said what are you waiting for is it possible you can answer up right off and tell what anybody on the other side of the earth is doing and yet can't tell what a person is doing who isn't three yards from you persons behind me know what i am doing with my right hand they will endorse you if you tell correctly he was still dumb very well i'll tell you why you don't speak up and tell it is because you don't know you a magician good friends this tramp is a mere fraud and liar this distressed the monks and terrified them they were not used to hearing these awful beings called names and they did not know what might be the consequence there was a dead silence now superstitious bodings were in every mind the magician began to pull his wits together and when he presently smiled an easy nonchalant smile it spread a mighty relief around for it indicated that his mood was not destructive he said it hath struck me speechless the frivolity of this person's speech let all know if perchance there be any who know it not that enchanters of my degree deign not to concern themselves with the doings of any but kings princes emperors them that be born in the purple and them only had ye asked me what arthur the great king is doing it were another matter and i had told ye but the doings of a subject interest me not oh i misunderstood you i thought you said anybody and so i supposed anybody included well anybody that is everybody it doth anybody that is of lofty birth and the better if he be royal that it beseemeth might be well said the abbot who saw his opportunity to smooth things and avert disaster for it were not likely that so wonderful a gift as this would be conferred for the revelation of the concerns of lesser beings than such as be born near to the summits of greatness our arthur the king would you know of him broke in the enchanter most gladly yea and gratefully everybody was full of awe and interest again right away the incorrigible idiots they watched the incantations absorbingly and looked at me with a there now what can you say to that air when the announcement came the king is weary with the chase and lieth in his palace these two hours sleeping a dreamless sleep god's benison upon him said the abbot and crossed himself may that sleep be to the refreshment of his body and his soul and so it might be if he were sleeping i said but the king is not sleeping the king rides here was trouble again a conflict of authority nobody knew which of us to believe 
I still had some reputation left. The magician's scorn was stirred, and he said, Lo, I have seen many wonderful soothsayers and prophets and magicians in my life days, but none before that could sit idle and see to the heart of things with never an incantation to help. You have lived in the woods and lost much by it. I use incantations myself, as this good brotherhood are aware, but only on occasions of moment. When it comes to sarcasming, I reckon I know how to keep my end up. That jab made this fellow squirm. The abbot inquired after the queen and the court, and got this information. They be all on sleep, being overcome by fatigue, like as to the king. I said, That is merely another lie. Half of them are about their amusements. The queen and the other half are not sleeping. They ride. Now perhaps you can spread yourself a little, and tell us where the king and queen and all that are this moment riding with them are going. They sleep now, as I said but on the morrow they will ride, for they go a journey toward the sea. And where will they be the day after tomorrow at Vespers? Far to the north of Camelot, and half their journey will be done. That is another lie by the space of a hundred and fifty miles. Their journey will not be merely half done, it will be all done, and they will be here in this valley. That was a noble shot. It set the abbot and the monks in a whirl of excitement, and it rocked the enchanter to his base. I follow the thing right up. If the king does not arrive, I will have myself ridden on a rail. If he does, I will ride you on a rail instead. Next day I went up to the telephone office, and found that the king had passed through two towns that were on the line. I spotted his progress on the succeeding day in the same way. I kept these matters to myself. The third day's reports showed that if he kept up his gait he would arrive by four in the afternoon. There was still no sign anywhere of interest in his coming. There seemed to be no preparations making to receive him in state. A strange thing, truly. Only one thing could explain this. That other magician had been cutting under me, sure. This was true. I asked a friend of mine, a monk, about it, and he said, yes. The magician had tried some further enchantments, and found out that the court had concluded to make no journey at all but stay at home. Think of that! Observe how much a reputation was worth in such a country. These people had seen me do the very showiest bit of magic in history, and the only one within their memory that had a positive value, and yet here they were, ready to take up with an adventurer who could offer no evidence of his powers but his mere unproven word. However, it was not good politics to let the king come without any fuss and feathers at all, so I went down and drummed up a procession of pilgrims, and smoked out a batch of hermits, and started them out at two o'clock to meet him. And that was the sort of state he arrived in. The abbot was helpless with rage and humiliation when I brought him out on a balcony and showed him the head of the state, marching in, and never a monk on hand to offer him welcome, and no stir of life or clang of joy-bell to glad his spirit. He took one look, and then flew to rouse out his forces. The next minute the bells were dinning furiously, and the various buildings were vomiting monks and nuns who went swarming in a rush toward the coming procession, and with them went that magician, and he was on a rail, too, by the abbot's order, and his reputation was in the mud, and mine was in the sky again. Yes, a man can keep his trademark current in such a country, but he can't sit around and do it. He has got to be on deck and attending to business right along. End of chapter 24 A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain Chapter 25 A Competitive Examination When the king traveled for change of air, or made a progress, or visited a distant noble whom he wished to bankrupt with the cost of his keep, part of the administration moved with him. It was a fashion of the time. The commission charged with the examination of candidates for posts in the army came with the king to the valley, whereas they could have transacted their business just as well at home. And although this expedition was strictly a holiday excursion for the king, he kept some of his business functions going just the same. He touched for the evil, as usual. He held court in the gate at sunrise, and tried cases, for he was himself chief justice of the king's bench. He shone very well in this latter office. He was a wise and humane judge, and he clearly did his honest best and fairest, according to his lights. That is a large reservation. His lights, I mean, 
his rearing, often colored his decisions. Whenever there was a dispute between a noble or gentleman and a person of lower degree, the king's leanings and sympathies were for the former class always, whether he suspected it or not. It was impossible that this should be otherwise. The blunting effects of slavery upon the slaveholder's moral perceptions are known and conceded, the world over. And a privileged class, an aristocracy, is but a band of slaveholders under another name. This has a harsh sound, and yet should not be offensive to any, even to the noble himself, unless the fact itself be an offense, for the statement simply formulates a fact. The repulsive feature of slavery is the thing, not its name. One needs but to hear an aristocrat speak of the classes that are below him to recognize, and in but indifferently modified measure, the very air and tone of the actual slaveholder, and behind these are the slaveholder's spirit, the slaveholder's blunted feeling. They are the result of the same cause in both cases the possessor's old and inbred custom of regarding himself as a superior being. The king's judgments wrought frequent injustices, but it was merely the fault of his training, his natural and unalterable sympathies. He was as unfitted for a judgeship as would be the average mother for the position of milk distributor to starving children in famine time. Her own children would fare a shade better than the rest. One very curious case came before the king. A young girl, an orphan, who had a considerable estate, married a fine young fellow who had nothing. The girl's property was within a seigneury held by the church. The bishop of the diocese, an arrogant scion of the great nobility, claimed the girl's estate on the ground that she had married privately, and thus had cheated the church out of one of its rights as lord of the seigneury, the one heretofore referred to as le droit du seigneur. The penalty of refusal or avoidance was confiscation. The girl's defense was that the lordship of the seigneury was vested in the bishop, and the particular right here involved was not transferable, but must be exercised by the lord himself or stand vacated, and that an older law of the church itself strictly barred the bishop from exercising it. It was a very odd case indeed. It reminded me of something I had read in my youth about the ingenious way in which the aldermen of London raised the money that built the mansion-house. A person who had not taken the sacrament according to the Anglican rite could not stand as a candidate for sheriff of London. Thus dissenters were ineligible. They could not run if asked. They could not serve if elected. The aldermen, who without any question were Yankees in disguise, hit upon this neat device. They passed a by-law imposing a fine of four hundred pounds upon any one who should refuse to be a candidate for sheriff, and a fine of six hundred pounds upon any person who, after being elected sheriff, refused to serve. Then they went to work and elected a lot of dissenters, one after another, and kept it up until they had collected fifteen thousand pounds in fines. And there stands the stately mansion-house to this day, to keep the blushing citizen in mind of a long past and lamented day when a band of Yankees slipped into London and played games of the sort that has given their race a unique and shady reputation among all truly good and holy peoples that be in the earth. The girl's case seemed strong to me. The bishop's case was just as strong. I did not see how the king was going to get out of this hole. But he got out. I append his decision. Truly I find small difficulty here, the matter being even a child's affair for simpleness, and the young bride had conveyed notice, as in duty bound, to her feudal lord and proper master and protector, the bishop, she had suffered no loss, for the said bishop could have got a dispensation making him, for temporary conveniency, eligible to the exercise of his said right, and thus would she have kept all she had. Whereas failing in her first duty, she hath by that failure failed in all, for whoso clinging to a rope severeth it above his hands, must fall. It being no defense to claim that the rest of the rope is sound, neither any deliverance from his peril as he shall find. Party, the woman's case is rotten at the source. 
it is the decree of the court that she forfeit to the said lord bishop all her goods even to the last farthing that she doth possess and be thereto mulcted in the costs next here was a tragic end to a beautiful honeymoon not yet three months old poor young creatures they had lived these three months lapped to the lips in worldly comforts these clothes and trinkets they were wearing were as fine and dainty as the shrewdest stretch of the sumptuary laws allowed to people of their degree and in these pretty clothes she crying on his shoulder and he trying to comfort her with hopeful words set to the music of despair they went from the judgment seat out into the world homeless bedless breadless why the very beggars by the roadsides were not so poor as they well the king was out of the hole and on terms satisfactory to the church and the rest of the aristocracy no doubt men write many fine and plausible arguments in support of monarchy but the fact remains that where every man in a state has a vote brutal laws are impossible arthur's people were of course poor material for a republic because they had been debased so long by monarchy and yet even they would have been intelligent enough to make short work of that law which the king had just been administering if it had been submitted to their full and free vote there is a phrase which has grown so common in the world's mouth that it has come to seem to have sense and meaning the sense and meaning implied when it is used that is the phrase which refers to this or that or the other nation as possibly being capable of self-government and the implied sense of it is that there has been a nation somewhere some time or other which wasn't capable of it wasn't as able to govern itself as some self-appointed specialists were or would be to govern it the masterminds of all nations in all ages have sprung in affluent multitude from the mass of the nation and from the mass of the nation only not from its privileged classes and so no matter what the nation's intellectual grade was whether high or low the bulk of its ability was in the long ranks of its nameless and its poor and so it never saw the day that it had not the material in abundance whereby to govern itself which is to assert an always self-proven fact that even the best governed and most free and most enlightened monarchy is still behind the best condition attainable by its people and that the same is true of kindred governments of lower grades all the way down to the lowest king arthur had hurried up the army business altogether beyond my calculations i had not supposed he would move in the matter while i was away and so i had not mapped out a scheme for determining the merits of officers i had only remarked that it would be wise to submit every candidate to a sharp and searching examination and privately i meant to put together a list of military qualifications that nobody could answer to but my west pointers that ought to have been attended to before i left for the king was so taken with the idea of a standing army that he couldn't wait but must get about it at once and get up as good a scheme of examination as he could invent out of his own head i was impatient to see what this was and to show too how much more admirable was the one which i should display to the examining board i intimated this gently to the king and it fired his curiosity when the board was assembled i followed him in and behind us came the candidates one of these candidates was a bright young west pointer of mine and with him were a couple of my west point professors when i saw the board i did not know whether to cry or to laugh the head of it was the officer known to later centuries as noroy king at arms the two other members were chiefs of bureaus in his department and all three were priests of course all officials who had to know how to read and write were priests my candidate was called first out of courtesy to me and the head of the board opened on him with official solemnity name malise son of webster 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 my my, my memory faileth to recall the name uh, condition weaver weaver god keep us the king was staggered from his summit to his foundations one clerk fainted and the others came near it the chairman pulled himself together and said indignantly it is sufficient get you hence but i appealed to the king i begged that my candidate might be examined 
the king was willing but the board who were all well-born folk implored the king to spare them the indignity of examining the weaver's son i knew they didn't know enough to examine him anyway so i joined my prayers to theirs and the king turned the duty over to my professors i had had a blackboard prepared and it was put up now and the circus began it was beautiful to hear the lad lay out the science of war and wallow in details of battle and siege of supply transportation mining and countermining grand tactics big strategy and little strategy signal service infantry cavalry artillery and all about siege guns field guns gatling guns rifled guns smooth bores musket practice revolver practice and not a solitary word of it all could these catfish make head or tail of you understand and it was handsome to see him chalk off mathematical nightmares on the blackboard that would stump the angels themselves and do it like nothing too all about eclipses and comets and solstices and constellations and meantime and sidereal time and dinner time and bedtime and every other imaginable thing above the clouds or under them that you could harry or bully rag an enemy with and make him wish he hadn't come and when the boy made his military salute and stood aside at last i was proud enough to hug him and all those other people were so dazed they looked partly petrified partly drunk and wholly caught out and snowed under i judged that the cake was ours and by a large majority education is a great thing this was the same youth who had come to west point so ignorant that when i asked him if a general officer should have a horse shot under him on the field of battle what ought he to do answered up naively and said get up and brush himself one of the young nobles was called up now i thought i would question him a little myself i said can your lordship read his face flushed indignantly and he fired this at me takest me for a clerk i trow i am not of a blood that answer the question he crowded his wrath down and made out to answer no can you write he wanted to resent this too but i said you will confine yourself to the questions and make no comments you are not here to air your blood or your graces and nothing of the sort will be permitted can you write no do you know the multiplication table i wit not what ye refer to how much is nine times six it is a mystery that is hidden from me by reason that the emergency requiring the fathoming of it hath not in my life days occurred and so not having no need to know this thing i abide barren of the knowledge if a trade a barrel of onions to b worth two pence the bushel in exchange for a sheep worth four pence and a dog worth a penny and c kill the dog before delivery because bitten by the same who mistook him for d what sum is still due to a from b and which party pays for the dog c or d and who gets the money if a is the penny sufficient or may he claim consequential damages in the form of additional money to represent the possible profit which might have inured from the dog and classifiable as earned increment that is to say usufruct verily in the all-wise and unknowable providence of god who moveth in mysterious ways his wonders to perform have i never heard the fellow to this question for confusion of the mind and congestion of the ducts of thought wherefore i beseech you let the dog and the onions and these people of the strange and godless names work out their several salvations from their piteous and wonderful difficulties without help of mine for indeed their trouble is sufficient as it is whereas an i tried to help i should but damage their cause the more and yet mayhap not live myself to see the dissolution wrought what do you know of the laws of attraction and gravitation if there be such mayhap his grace the king did promulgate them whilst that i lay sick about the beginning of the year and thereby failed to hear his proclamation what do you know of the science of optics i know of governors of places and seneschals of castles and sheriffs of counties and many like small offices and titles of honor but him you call the science of optics i have not heard of before peradventure it is a new dignity yes in this country 
Try to conceive of this mollusk gravely applying for an official position of any kind under the sun. Why, he had all the earmarks of a typewriter copyist, if you leave out the disposition to contribute uninvited emendations of your grammar and punctuation. It was unaccountable that he didn't attempt a little help of that sort out of his majestic supply of incapacity for the job. But that didn't prove that he hadn't material in him for the disposition. It only proved that he wasn't a typewriter copyist yet. After nagging him a little more, I let the professors loose on him, and they turned him inside out, on the line of scientific war, and found him empty, of course. He knew somewhat about the warfare of the time, bushwhacking around for ogres, and bullfights in the tournament ring, and such things. But otherwise he was empty and useless. Then we took the other young noble in hand, and he was the first one's twin, for ignorance and incapacity. I delivered them into the hands of the chairman of the board with the comfortable consciousness that their cake was dough. They were examined in the previous order of precedence. Name, so you please. Pertipole, son of Sir Pertipole, Baron of Barleymash. Grandfather? Also Sir Pertipole, Baron of Barleymash. Great-grandfather? The same name and title. Great-great-grandfather? We had none, worshipful sir, the line failing before it had reached so far back. It mattereth not. It is a good four generations, and fulfilleth the requirements of the rule. Fulfills what rule? I asked. The rule requiring four generations of nobility, or else the candidate is not eligible. A man not eligible for a lieutenancy in the army unless he can prove four generations of noble descent? Even so, neither lieutenant nor any other officer may be commissioned without that qualification. Oh, come, this is an astonishing thing. What good is such a qualification as that? What good? It is a hardy question, fair sir and boss, since it doth go far to impugn the wisdom of even our holy mother church herself. As how? For that she hath established the selfsame rule regarding saints. By her law none may be canonized until he hath lain dead four generations. I see, I see, it is the same thing. It is wonderful. In the one case a man lies dead alive four generations, mummified in ignorance and sloth, and that qualifies him to command live people, and take their weal and woe into his impotent hands. And in the other case a man lies bedded with death and worms four generations, and that qualifies him for office in the celestial camp. Does the king's grace approve of this strange law? Why, truly, I see naught about it that is strange. All places of honor and of profit do belong, by natural right, to them that be of noble blood. And so these dignities in the army are their property, and would be so without this or any rule. The rule is but to mark a limit. Its purpose is to keep out too recent blood, which would bring into contempt these offices, and men of lofty lineage would turn their backs, and scorn to take them. I would blame, and I permitted this calamity. You can permit it, and you are minded so to do, for you have the delegated authority, but that the king should do it were a most strange madness, and not comprehensible to any. I yield. Proceed, Sir Chief of the Herald's College. The chairman resumed as follows. By what illustrious achievement for the honor of the throne and state did the founder of your great line lift himself to the sacred dignity of the British nobility? He built a brewery. Sire, the board finds this candidate perfect in all the requirements and qualifications for military command, and doth hold his case open for a decision after due examination of his competitor. The competitor came forward, and proved exactly four generations of nobility himself. So there was a tie in military qualifications that far. He stood aside a moment, and Sir Pertipole was questioned further. Of what condition was the wife of the founder of your line? She came of the highest landed gentry, yet she was not noble. She was gracious and pure and charitable, of a blameless life and character, insomuch that in these regards was she peer of the best lady in the land. That will do. Stand down. He called up the competing lordling again, and asked, 
what was the rank and condition of the great-grandmother who conferred british nobility upon your great house she was a king's leman and did climb to that splendid eminence by her own upholden merit from the sewer where she was born ah this indeed is true nobility this is the right and perfect intermixture the lieutenancy is yours fair lord hold it not in contempt it is the humble step which will lead to grandeurs more worthy of the splendor of an origin like to thine i was down in the bottomless pit of humiliation i had promised myself an easy and zenith scouring triumph and this was the outcome i was almost ashamed to look my poor disappointed cadet in the face i told him to go home and be patient this wasn't the end i had a private audience with the king and made a proposition i said it was quite right to officer that regiment with nobilities and he couldn't have done a wiser thing it would also be a good idea to add five hundred officers to it in fact i had as many officers as there were nobles and relatives of nobles in the country even if there should finally be five times as many officers as privates in it and thus make it the crack regiment the envied regiment the king's own regiment and entitled to fight on its own hook and in its own way and go whither it would and come when it pleased in time of war and be utterly swell and independent this would make that regiment the heart's desire of all the nobility and they would all be satisfied and happy then we would make up the rest of the standing army out of commonplace materials and officer it with nobodies as was proper nobodies selected on the basis of mere efficiency and we would make this regiment toe the line allow it no aristocratic freedom from restraint and force it to do all the work and persistent hammering to the end that whenever the king's own was tired and wanted to go off for a change and rummage around amongst ogres and have a good time it could go without uneasiness knowing that matters were in safe hands behind it and business going to be continued at the old stand same as usual the king was charmed with the idea when i noticed that it gave me a valuable notion i thought i saw my way out of an old and stubborn difficulty at last you see the royalties of the pendragon stock were a long-lived race and very fruitful whenever a child was born to any of these and it was pretty often there was wild joy in the nation's mouth and piteous sorrow in the nation's heart the joy was questionable but the grief was honest because the event meant another call for a royal grant long was the list of these royalties and they were a heavy and steadily increasing burden upon the treasury and a menace to the crown yet arthur could not believe this latter fact and he would not listen to any of my various projects for substituting something in the place of the royal grants if i could have persuaded him to now and then provide a support for one of these outlying scions from his own pocket i could have made a grand to-do over it and it would have had a good effect with the nation but no he wouldn't hear of such a thing he had something like a religious passion for royal grant he seemed to look upon it as a sort of sacred swag and one could not irritate him in any way so quickly and so surely as by an attack upon that venerable institution if i ventured to cautiously hint that there was not another respectable family in england that would humble itself to hold out the hat however that is as far as i ever got he always cut me short there and peremptorily too but i believed i saw my chance at last i would form this crack regiment out of officers alone not a single private half of it would consist of nobles who should fill all the places up to major general and serve gratis and pay their own expenses and they would be glad to do this when they should learn that the rest of the regiment would consist exclusively of princes of the blood these princes of the blood should range in rank from lieutenant general up to field marshal and be gorgeously salaried and equipped and fed by the state moreover and this was the master stroke it should be decreed that these princely grandees should be always addressed by a stunningly gaudy and awe-compelling title which i would presently invent and they and they only in all england should be so addressed finally all princes of the blood should have free choice join that regiment get that great title and renounce the royal grant or stay out and receive a grant neatest touch of all unborn but imminent princes of the blood could be born into the regiment and start fair with good wages and a permanent situation upon due notice from the parents 
all the boys would join i was sure of that so all existing grants would be relinquished that the newly born would always join was equally certain within sixty days that quaint and bizarre anomaly the royal grant would cease to be a living fact and take its place among the curiosities of the past End of chapter twenty five a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain Chapter twenty six The First Newspaper When I told the King I was going out disguised as a petty freeman to scour the country and familiarize myself with the humbler life of the people, he was all afire with the novelty of the thing in a minute, and was bound to take a chance in the adventure himself. Nothing should stop him. He would drop everything and go along. It was the prettiest idea he had run across for many a day. He wanted to glide out the back way and start at once, but I showed him that that wouldn't answer. You see, he was billed for the king's evil, to touch for it, I mean, and it wouldn't be right to disappoint the house, and it wouldn't make a delay worth considering, anyway. It was only a one-night stand, and I thought he ought to tell the queen he was going away. He clouded up at that, and looked sad. I was sorry I'd spoken, especially when he said mournfully, thou forgettest that lancelot is here and where lancelot is she noteth not the going forth of the king nor what day he returneth of course i changed the subject yes guinevere was beautiful it is true but take her all round she was pretty slack i never meddled in these matters they weren't my affair but i did hate to see the way things were going on and i don't mind saying that much many's the time she had asked me sir boss hast seen sir lancelot bout but if ever she went fretting around for the king i didn't happen to be around at the time there was a very good layout for the king's evil business very tidy and creditable the king sat under a canopy of state about him were clustered a large body of the clergy in full canonicals conspicuous both for location and personal outfit stood marinel a hermit of the quack doctor species to introduce the sick all abroad over the spacious floor and clear down to the doors in a thick jumble lay or sat the scrofulous under a strong light it was as good as a tableau in fact it had all the look of being gotten up for that though it wasn't there were eight hundred sick people present the work was slow it lacked the interest of novelty for me because i had seen the ceremonies before the thing soon became tedious but the proprieties required me to stick it out. The doctor was there for the reason that in all such crowds there were many people who only imagined something was the matter with them, and many who were consciously sound, but wanted the immortal honor of fleshly contact with a king, and yet others who pretended to illness in order to get the piece of coin that went with the touch. Up to this time this coin had been a wee little gold piece worth about a third of a dollar. When you consider how much that amount of money would buy, in that age and country, and how usual it was to be scrofulous when not dead, you would understand that the annual king's evil appropriation was just the river and harbor bill of that government for the grip it took on the treasury, and the chance it afforded for skinning the surplus. So I had privately concluded to touch the treasury itself for the king's evil. I covered six-sevenths of the appropriation into the treasury a week before starting from Camelot on my adventures, and ordered that the other seventh be inflated into five-cent nickels and delivered into the hands of the head clerk of the King's Evil Department, a nickel to take the place of each gold coin, you see, and do its work for it. It might strain the nickel some, but I judged it could stand it. As a rule, I do not approve of watering stock, but I considered it square enough in this case, for it was just a gift, anyway. Of course, you can water a gift as much as you want to, and I generally do. The old coin and silver coins of the country were of ancient and unknown origin, as a rule, but some of them were Roman. They were ill-shapen, and seldom rounder than a moon that is a week past the full. They were hammered, not minted and they were so worn with use that the devices upon them were as illegible as blisters, and looked like them. I judged that a sharp, bright new nickel, with a first-rate likeness of the king on one side of it, and Guinevere on the other, and a blooming pious motto, would take the tuck out of scrofula as handy as a nobler coin, and please the scrofulous fancy more. And I was right. This batch was the first it was tried on, and it worked to a charm. 
The saving in expense was a notable economy. You will see that by these figures. We touched a trifle over seven hundred of the eight hundred patients. At former rates this would have cost the government about two hundred and forty dollars. At the new rate we pulled through for about thirty-five dollars, thus saving upward of two hundred dollars at one swoop. To appreciate the full magnitude of this stroke, consider these other figures. The annual expenses of a national government amount to the equivalent of a contribution of three days' average wages of every individual of the population, counting every individual as if he were a man. If you take a nation of sixty million, where average wages are two dollars per day, three days' wages taken from each individual will provide three hundred and sixty million dollars, and pay the government's expenses. In my day, in my own country, this money was collected from imposts, and the citizen imagined that the foreign importer paid it, and it made him comfortable to think so, whereas in fact it was paid by the American people, and was so equally and exactly distributed among them that the annual cost to the one hundred millionaire and the annual cost to the sucking child of the day laborer was precisely the same. Each paid six dollars. Nothing could be equaler than that, I reckon. Well, Scotland and Ireland were tributary to Arthur, and the united populations of the British Islands amounted to something less than one million. A mechanic's average wage was three cents a day, when he paid his own keep. By this rule the national government's expenses were ninety thousand dollars a year, or about two hundred and fifty dollars a day. Thus, by the substitution of nickels for gold on a king's evil day, I not only injured no one, dissatisfied no one, but pleased all concerned, and saved four-fifths of that day's national expense into the bargain, a saving which would have been the equivalent of eight hundred thousand dollars in my day in America. In making this substitution I had drawn upon the wisdom of a very remote source, the wisdom of my boyhood. For the true statesman does not despise any wisdom, however lowly may be its origin. In my boyhood I had always saved my pennies and contributed buttons to the foreign missionary cause. The buttons would answer the ignorant savage as well as the coin. The coin would answer me better than the buttons. All hands were happy, and nobody hurt. Marinel took the patients as they came. He examined the candidate. If he couldn't qualify, he was warmed off. If he could, he was passed along to the king. A priest pronounced the words, They shall lay their hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Then the king stroked the ulcers, while the reading continued. Finally the patient graduated, and got his nickel, the king hanging it around his neck himself, and was dismissed. Would you think that that would cure? It certainly did. Any mummery will cure if the patient's faith is strong in it. Up by Astolat there was a chapel where the Virgin had once appeared to a girl who used to herd geese around there. The girl said so herself, and they built the chapel upon that spot and hung a picture in it representing the occurrence, a picture which you would think it dangerous for a sick person to approach, whereas on the contrary, thousands of the lame and the sick came and prayed before it every year, and went away whole and sound, and even the well could look upon it and live. Of course, when I was told these things I did not believe them, but when I went there and saw them I had to succumb. I saw the cures affected myself, and they were real cures, and not questionable. I saw cripples, whom I had seen around Camelot for years on crutches, arrive, and pray before that picture and put down their crutches, and walk off without a limp. There were piles of crutches there which had been left by such people as a testimony. In other places people operated on a patient's mind, without saying a word to him, and cured him. In others, experts assembled patients in a room and prayed over them, and appealed to their faith, and those patients went away cured. Wherever you find a king who can't cure the king's evil, you can be sure that the most valuable superstition that supports his throne, the subject's belief in the divine appointment of his sovereign, has passed away. In my youth the monarchs of England had ceased to touch for the evil, but there was no occasion for this diffidence. They could have cured it forty-nine times in fifty. Well, when the priest had been droning for three hours, and the good king polishing the evidences, and the sick were still pressing forward as plenty as ever, I got to feeling intolerably bored. I was sitting by an open window not far from the canopy of state. 
for the five hundredth time a patient stood forward to have his repulsivenesses stroked again those words were being droned out they shall lay their hands on the sick when outside there rang clear as a clarion a note that enchanted my soul and tumbled thirteen worthless centuries about my ears camelot weekly hosanna and literary volcano latest eruption only two cents all about the big miracle in the valley of holiness one greater than kings had arrived the newsboy but i was the only person in all that throng who knew the meaning of this mighty birth and what this imperial magician was come into the world to do i dropped a nickel out of the window and got my paper the adam newsboy of the world went around the corner to get my change it is around the corner yet it was delicious to see a newspaper again yet i was conscious of a secret shock when my eye fell upon the first batch of display headlines i had lived in a clammy atmosphere of reverence respect deference so long that they sent a quivery little cold wave through me high times in the valley of holiness the water works corked brer merlin works his arts but gets left but the boss scores on his first innings the miraculous well uncorked amid awful outbursts of infernal fire and smoke and thunder the buzzard roost astonished unparalleled rejoinings and so on and so on yes it was too loud once i could have enjoyed it and seen nothing out of the way about it but now its note was discordant it was good arkansas journalism but this was not arkansas moreover the next to the last line was calculated to give offense to the hermits and perhaps lose us their advertising indeed there was too lightsome a tone of flippancy all through the paper it was plain i had undergone a considerable change without noticing it i found myself unpleasantly affected by pert little irreverencies which would have seemed but proper and airy graces of speech at an earlier period of my life there was an abundance of the following breed of items and they discomforted me local smoke and cinders sir lancelot met up with old king agrivance of ireland unexpectedly last week over on the moor south of sir balmoral le merveilleuse hogs dasture the widow has been notified expedition number three will start a doat uh, the first of next month on a search for sir sagramour le Desiris. it is in command of the renowned knight of the red lawns assisted by sir persant of inde who is competent intelligent courteous and in every way a brick and further assisted by sir palamides the saracen who is no huckleberry himself this is no picnic these boys mean business the readers of the hosanna will regret to learn that the handsome and popular sir charolais of gaul who during his four weeks stay at the bull and halibut this city has won every heart by his polished manners and elegant conversation will pull out to-day for home give us another call charlie the business end of the funeral of the late sir dalliance the duke's son of cornwall killed in an encounter with the giant of the knotted bludgeon last tuesday on the borders of the plain of enchantment was in the hands of the ever affable and efficient mumble prince of undertakers then whom there exists none by whom it were a more satisfying pleasure to have the last sad offices performed give him a trial the cordial thanks of the hosanna office are due from editor down to devil to the ever courteous and thoughtful lord high stood of the palace's third assistant vert for several saucers of ice cream a quality calculated to make the eye of the recipients humid with gratitude and it done it when this administration wants to chalk up a desirable name for early promotion the hosanna would like a chance to suggest the demoiselle irene dewlap of south astolat is visiting her uncle the popular host of the cattlemen's boarding hoax liver lane this city young barker the bellows mender is home again and looks much improved by his vacation round-up among the outlying smithies see his ad 
of course it was good enough journalism for a beginning i knew that quite well and yet it was somehow disappointing the court circular pleased me better indeed its simple and dignified respectfulness was a distinct refreshment to me after all those disgraceful familiarities but even it could have been improved do what one may there is no getting an air of variety into a court circular i acknowledge that there is a profound monotonousness about its facts that baffles and defeats one's sincerest efforts to make them sparkle and enthuse the best way to manage in fact the only sensible way is to disguise repetitiousness of fact under variety of form skin your fact each time and lay on a new cuticle of words it deceives the eye you think it is a new fact it gives you the idea that the court is carrying on like everything this excites you and you drain the whole column with a good appetite and perhaps never notice that it's a barrel of soup made out of a single bean clarence's way was good it was simple it was dignified it was direct and businesslike all i say is it was not the best way court circular on monday the king rode in the park on tuesday the king rode in the park on wednesday the king rode in the park on thursday the king rode in the park on friday the king rode in the park on saturday the king rode in the park on sunday the king rode in the park however take the paper by and large i was vastly pleased with it little crudities of a mechanical sort were observable here and there but there were not enough of them to amount to anything and it was good enough arkansas proof-reading anyhow and better than was needed in arthur's day and realm as a rule the grammar was leaky and the construction more or less lame but i did not much mind these things they are common defects of my own and one mustn't criticize other people on grounds where he can't stand perpendicular himself i was hungry enough for literature to want to take down the whole paper at this one meal but i got only a few bites and then had to postpone because the monks around me beseeched me so with eager questions what is this curious thing what is it for is it a handkerchief saddle blanket part of a shirt what is it made of how thin it is and how dainty and frail and how it rattles will it wear do you think and won't the rain injure it is it writing that appears on it or is it only ornamentation they suspected it was writing because those among them who knew how to read latin and had a smattering of greek recognized some of the letters but they could make nothing out of the result as a whole i put my information in the simplest form i could it is a public journal i will explain what that is another time it is not cloth it is made of paper some time i will explain what paper is the lines on it are reading matter and not written by hand but printed by and by i will explain what printing is a thousand of these sheets have been made all exactly like this in every minute detail they can't be told apart then they all broke out with exclamations of surprise and admiration a thousand verily a mighty work a year's work for many men no merely a day's work for a man and a boy they crossed themselves and whiffed out a protective prayer or two ah a miracle a wonder dark work of enchantment i let it go at that then i read in a low voice to as many as could crowd their shaven heads within hearing distance part of the account of the miracle of the restoration of the well and was accompanied by astonished and reverent ejaculations all through ah how true amazing amazing these be the very haps as they happened in marvellous exactness and might they take this strange thing in their hands and feel of it and examine it they would be very careful yes they took it handling it as cautiously and devotedly as if it had been some holy thing come from some supernatural region and gently felt of its texture caressed its pleasant smooth surface with lingering touch and scanned the mysterious characters with fascinated eyes these grouped bent heads these charmed faces these speaking eyes how beautiful to me for was not this my darling and was not all this mute wonder and interest and homage a most eloquent tribute and unforced compliment to it i knew then how a mother feels when women 
whether strangers or friends, take her new baby and close themselves about it with one eager impulse, and bend their heads over it in a tranced adoration that makes all the rest of the universe vanish out of their consciousness, and be as if it were not for that time. I knew how she feels, and that there is no other satisfied ambition, whether of king, conqueror, or poet, that ever reaches halfway to that serene far summit, or yields half so divine a contentment. During all the rest of the seance my paper travelled from group to group, all up and down and about that huge hall, and my happy eye was upon it always, and I sat motionless, steeped in satisfaction, drunk with enjoyment. Yes, this was heaven. I was tasting it once, if I might never taste it more. End of chapter 26